Um, and so, and it's becoming aware of each other. That's, um, you know, again, the group consciousness. The medicine showed me that, um, you know, uh, we are here for each other. Um, I'm not here alone. I'm not here to siphon off the earth and just suck on opium and nod out. I'm, I'm, I'm here to give. We all are, are all here to give. Um, we all have something very special and unique to give. And uh, next. Really? Holy shit. Um, the death, the mortality and death, there's a huge, you know, shroud of death surrounding Ibogaine, okay? And um, Jonathan mentioned it in an article that he wrote for um, the, the MAPS Bulletin. Um, Ibogaine, the Ibogaine journey is, is very much like a near-death experience and, and a rebirth experience. Many people say that they see other souls that have passed on. Many people feel like they see themselves looking back at themselves. Um, in, in a state of death. Um, it, so it's important to know how to translate all of this, understand all of this, and be able to communicate this back with the client. Um, deaths with the clinic. Um, you know, I came into a, a clinic where deaths had occurred. Deaths have occurred at my clinic. There's nothing that prepares you for death like the one that happens right in front of you. And it immediately, you know, it's, oh, am I meant to do this? You know, when I bought the clinic, the deaths had already occurred and I took on the name I began association and people said, you're carrying this on, yes, I'm taking responsibility. And that was my relationship with Ken Alper where we started really investigating the deaths. So we've learned an incredible amount from, the, from that. Uh, we do have block ports, pulmonary embolisms are no longer occurring because of a lot of the things that we've discovered from really analyzing the deaths. And it's really important, I think, for us to consider the Dymaxion car. Um, the Dymaxion car was developed in the 30s by Bucky Fuller and um, was uh, in trials and it, uh, someone died, a driver died. And this was a car that 11 people could fit in, went 90 miles, you know, an hour and 30 miles to the gallon in 1930. And studies were uh, you know, completely halted when the person died. And, I don't, I, I don't want Ibogaine to be the next Dymaxion car, you know, let's not do this. We know this is a technology that works, let's, let's, let's all be honest about the dangers and um, be as safe as possible and not lose out on something so vital and, vital and critical to society. Next. Uh, the provider's level of health. Do I embody what I'm trying to engender? Uh, this is another example of the organic therapeutic process and this is where I bring in my whole, this is my training, my university is my whole experience with drugs. Um, at, at the clinic, um, I'm constantly telling people what I have gone through, what I went through, so that I can be on the same page with them and that level of trust can be there. Next, um, group consciousness and intuition, owning my skills. Um, healthcare providers have the education of Western <coughs> medications, but addicts have muscle memory of them. And this is, again, my training and what I can contribute. You know, a lot of doctor, the doctors would be like, how did you know, how did you know how to put that guy to sleep with, you know, this little cocktail? Or how did you know how to give Ibogaine right then or not enough, you know? And, and you really, like, climb into that person. And teaching people and teaching doctors about how to be in your own body and then also actually uh, <laughs> be in other people's bodies <laughs> um, is a unique... Uh, uh, this is it's a unique job description for me, let's just put it that way. But it's, I, it's, it's really... A, a, I love it. Next. Uh, this is our clinic. Um, this is where we are now. That's the living room. Next. Um, I began treatment today. Um, we, we have a holistic integrated model. It's a new paradigm that's forming. We, because of you know, deaths that occurred and uh, learning about the deaths and a lot of people coming to us because we have medical support, we started getting a lot of people coming in next that uh, really um, um, or we're ill, really, really compromised, late stage addicts, people who have been on methadone for 40 years, 35 years, 60 year old, 7 year old people on methadone, Xanax, all sorts of overweight, all sorts of things. So what we established was a stabilization um, process and this is again from communing with the community with all the other people and realizing what really works. You can't just do drive-by Ibogaine treatments. These are people coming in doing something so intense to their bodies, and so we started stabilizing people on opiates um, or even or other medications and doing other clinical support, and then increasing our timeline. We started working with amino acids, doing cleanses. We started studying cancer therapies and uh, realizing that um, addicts are a lot like uh, cancer patients, and 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 doing starting treatments that that worked uh, uh, and and. Uh, 
let's see here, body work, hep blocks, on-site therapy, the MAP study, we got that going again, the quality of life study, which Kingsley Brown is going to talk about, is another study that we got going. Uh, it's really exciting seeing, you know, not just are people clean or are they not clean, but how does their quality of life improve? And that's a, a very important question when it comes to higher gain. Um, and we're also engaged in much more extensive data collection, which will hopefully lead to more studies. Next. Um, so I'm off drugs, so now what? Okay. Um, you get people off drugs and then what happens? I mean, and also they've had this, many people in an extremely mystical experience or an awareness of themselves where they see themselves like I did on my first Ibogaine experience where I was completely perfect and whole, connected to everything, no beginning, no end. This was a complete um, sense of, of, of true wisdom that I, 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 I brought in and established with and, and try and inject into the treatments all of the time. How are we going to be in our bodies? So we get off the drugs, and then we have to learn how to deal with being in our bodies and how to develop a family, and, 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 and Ibogaine brings us together in that, in that way. And so these are the questions that are coming up. How do you connect? The aftercare. So this, we started developing an, um, an, an aftercare. Well, we wanted to for years, and it started happening at the clinic where people were staying longer, and now we have an aftercare program. We treated a woman who came through with amazing treatment, and she now uh, runs the aftercare. Uh, Bruno and Anwar also have aftercare. Anwar G was in South Africa. Uh, the next thing that we've done also is establish work with land, and that's been something that we just started recently. We finally uh, partnered with someone, and we are building. We built a sweat lodge and had ceremonies there, and this is really wonderful because it's providing more of a uh, link for um, people who have no rites of passage. These a lot of twenty-somethings that you know really need to connect with the land. Next. What's next? The collective of providers. Um, this is what we're trying to establish. It's a big part of what Pangea. Pangea is the global, um, the, the, the sense of global awareness that we are all together, that we are all one. Um, and when people come through for their ibogaine treatment, they almost immediately want to serve somehow. It's something that happens with the medicine, where they climb out of them, themselves and realize that they have something to give. For me, next, Afghanistan. That's where I want to go next. Um, I think that would be a really amazing place to see that root blow up there. Um, the local low-cost treatment in Tijuana, that's we're working on that right now. And training and manual, developing a new manual and training other providers. It's because this medicine is growing at an exponential rate. I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Claire. Um, Hi. Thanks for your work. Um, it's good. That's the reason why I'm standing here. Um, I had a, a technical question. Um, could you elaborate your protocol for um, heroin-dependent users and the time and dosages that you um, use for opioid detox? Yeah. Um, we, that's something that's interesting as well with us. We, every individual comes in and shows us how we're going to treat them. There are standard protocols that have been developed where, you know, it's probably approximately 15 to 25 milligrams per kilo are used for an average heroin dependency, but it depends on the length, the, the length of use also, how many years someone's been on heroin. We start with an initial test dose, and then we build up, and we let the body show us how to treat it. I can I sometimes will have an idea. Yeah, I can see that guy's going to need overall probably 40, 50 milligrams per kilo of ibogaine. But we don't know until we that body speaks to us, and that's why we start gathering all the information with the labs. We get their liver enzymes, we get their triglycerides. We look at so much to see how we're going to treat people, and in the stabilization process. When we're bringing, when we're stabilizing people on opiates, we see how much they can handle the withdrawal. We can see if they're going to, if how where the withdrawal symptoms present, and we can tell whether this is going to be a really twitchy client, and we're going to have to hit them with a lot of ibogaine, or if they're extremely sensitive. Some people are surprisingly extremely sensitive. I can talk to you privately afterwards about more detail, so that I can take some other questions. But it's where we don't have a standard. You know, okay, this is heroin, 15 milligrams per kilo, 25. But that's. Yep, uh, Bruce Seawick. A uh, quick question. Uh, do you believe in the disease model of addiction? What is your philosophy on that? Oh, thank, thank you for bringing that up. I really wanted to touch on that in my talk, and I didn't get a chance to. I, I, I do not. That The message that I got when I, when I took Ibogaine was that I was perfect, that I am perfect. And so it was something that touched something on me that I knew that was inside of me the whole time, and I believe that's true for all of us. Um, when I 
speak to people on the phone and I start talking about my experience, they immediate, it resonates immediately for them that they are whole as well. And that, that it, to, to say that you're an addict over and over and over again and talk about character defects is something we do not need to do in order to elevate ourselves. Oh. <laughs> what we do at the clinic is we find that health. And sometimes people come in really, really, really sick. The untreatable, treating the untreatable, what I was talking about there. There are other clinics that go, no way, we're not touching that guy. And we find that place. And we and he'll tell you about what one of the people that he that we treated that he's that, that Kingley's going to talk about that you know, the level of health there was practically non-existent. But we work with people on finding that, and then we build on that. You build on the health, you're only going to get more health. You build on the z disease, and you're still talking about sickness. Thank you. I have amazing amounts of admiration for what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. My question is not really clearly formulated, but um, the first time that I uh, ingested this, in spite of all the resourcing and preparation that I could do, for the first hour or so, <laughs> I had to use an extreme amount of will to get my respiratory mechanism to work. And so I guess the basic trajectory of my question is, in terms of potential lethal effect and fa actual fatalities, um, do you have any intuitive feel for, um, for that kind of issue, like maybe uh, somebody just let go? Maybe yes. they weren't actually driven out of existence by toxicity or overdose. Right. Yes, very much so. Thanks for asking me that question. The, 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 spirit, the spirit of life. Uh, I do a pro-life contract with everybody before I administer the medicine, and that's after several days of, of being with, med with them. And, and now, I, I never treat someone right on the same day. And many people are kind of suicidal, you know, when they're coming in. When you're doing drugs, you're kind of slowly killing yourself, you know, in a way. Um, so um, that, that sense of letting go, many people have told me that and when you watch the heart rate go down, and um, I've had n numerous people tell me, Claire, how did you know? Like when we come and we move them and get them up and get them going, and you know we, we've got we, they they they're saying I just wanted to give up. You go to that place, and that's why that contract is so important. Where I say, you know, if you get into a space where you feel like you're so out of your body and it feels so good, because that can feel really good for someone who's been you know burdened by a body their whole lives. You need to come back, and you need to make me that promise. And we, we go back, we go back and forth until we're completely on the same page. And sometimes that takes another day. You know, sometimes people aren't ready. Yeah. So, well, let me uh, well join me in thanking Claire. Sorry. <laughs>